Good morning, I'm Dr Renu Epen, urologist here at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, Australia. It's the height of a glorious summer in Melbourne and I bring you greetings from the multidisciplinary GU Oncology team here at Peter Mac. Prostate cancer has certainly held the limelight and our attention this year with major advances in theranostics and the treatment of metastatic castration resistant disease. There have also been fantastic leaps in our understanding of using the current best imaging technology to triage and diagnose prostate cancer. As urologists, we have battled many critical barriers that PSA screening poses, including unnecessary biopsies, as well as overdiagnosis and overtreatment of clinically insignificant prostate cancer. We know from landmark trials such as Precision and Promise that prostate MRI prior to biopsy can improve the detection of clinically significant disease whilst reducing the detection of insignificant disease. But how does it perform in a screening population? Let's consider a situation we all face on a typical day at the office. A man in his mid-50s with a PSA of 5 on routine blood tests. He's fit and healthy with no significant family history of prostate cancer. His digital rectal examination reveals a slightly enlarged, smooth, benign filling prostate. What's next for him? Straight to biopsy? MRI prostate first? If MRI is positive, do we only do targeted biopsies or both targeted and systematic biopsies? These are the questions that Martin Eklund and his team from the SDH LM3 consortium have set out to answer. They conducted a prospective population-based non-inferiority trial of over 1,500 men aged 50 to 74 with a PSA of 3 or greater. These men were randomised to undergo a standard biopsy or to have an MRI and then a combined MRI targeted and standard biopsy if the MRI was positive. The primary outcome was the proportion of men diagnosed with clinically significant cancer and this was similar in both groups. Therefore, the MRI group was non-inferior to standard biopsy only. An important secondary outcome was the proportion of men who were diagnosed with clinically insignificant or Gleason 6 prostate cancer, which was much lower in the MRI group. The authors normalised their results to 10,000 men and found that combined biopsy in men with a positive MRI resulted in fewer biopsies, fewer benign biopsies and fewer clinically insignificant cancers. The cost of an MRI could be offset by a lower biopsy rate and the potential reduction of overtreatment supporting its use in prostate cancer screening. And the question of targeted biopsy versus targeted and standard? Eklund's group found that if only targeted biopsies were done, the detection of 1.7 fewer clinically significant cancers would be delayed for each clinically insignificant cancer avoided and therefore supported the use of the combined approach. So what are the take home messages from this paper? Eklund's team demonstrate that MRI with targeted and standard biopsy is not inferior to standard biopsy alone and reduces the diagnosis of clinically insignificant prostate cancer. Now back to our patient. He undergoes an MRI and it's equivocal. Pyrat 3, some BPH. Where do we go from here? Do we go ahead with prostate biopsy? Can we streamline the diagnosis of prostate cancer even further? That's right, no prostate cancer session is complete without mentioning PSMA PET. The pro-PSMA trial from Michael Hoffman and the team at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre was a landmark paper from 2020 that showed the superior accuracy of PSMA PET over conventional imaging in the staging of prostate cancer. But what about its role in the detection of disease? The primary trial made headlines in 2021 with a paper published in European Urology. Led by Louise Emmett, this was a prospective multi phase two imaging study to determine whether the combination of PSMA PET and MRI was superior to MRI alone in the detection of prostate cancer. 296 men with clinically suspected prostate cancer who had undergone a recent MRI and were planned for a prostate biopsy based on clinical risk and MRI results were enrolled in the trial and underwent a pelvic-only PSMA PET CT. With reporters blinded to other imaging results, the MRI and PSMA PET were read separately and results compared to a combination of both modalities. The primary endpoint of the trial was a change in negative predictive value between MRI alone versus combined MRI and PSMA PET for the detection of prostate cancer. A key secondary endpoint was the proportion of men who could safely avoid biopsy with negative PSMA and MRI. The authors demonstrated that combined PSMA and MRI had a statistically significant increase in negative predictive value compared with MRI alone. If men with negative findings on combined imaging avoided a biopsy, 3.1% of clinically significant cancers would be missed. 
compared to a much higher 17% in the MRI alone group. The synergistic benefit of PSMA PET and MRI was particularly relevant for men who had negative or equivocal MRI, with 90% of clinically significant cancers with PIRATS 2 or 3 on MRI identified by PSMA. PSMA intensity and SUV max also appeared to be associated with tumour aggressiveness on histopathology. Now, we spoke with Louise Emmett recently on GUCAST. You know, those guys who do have those red flags, uh, who have a negative MRI uh, and you do a PSMA PET, the pickup rate was 90% for all significant malignancy in those groups. And similarly with the PIRADS 3, you know, you might not have a target on a PIRADS 3, but we had targets on the PSMA PET for biopsy. Um, and the pickup rate was also 90% in PIRADS 3. How does this help us in that tricky situation where a patient has a negative or equivocal MRI, but there is still a clinical suspicion of prostate cancer? Can PSMA PET be of use in this situation? Can you avoid a biopsy in those with negative PSMA PET? Can a PSMA PET help to target the biopsy? The PRIMARY2 trial will help to address these questions, a randomised multi-centre trial now recruiting across Australia. So our patient undergoes a PSMA PET given his equivocal MRI, and there was an area of high avidity in the prostate with no evidence of metastatic disease. He's had his prostate biopsy, which shows Gleason grade group 3 disease. Following multidisciplinary consultations, he has opted for a radical prostatectomy. The final topic addresses the age-old debate of the role of pelvic lymph node dissection in prostate cancer. We all know that the goals of a lymphadenectomy in cancer surgery are to first, improve nodal staging, second, identify the need for adjuvant treatment, and third, improve long-term oncological outcomes. The impact of extended pelvic lymphadenectomy in improving oncological outcomes in prostate cancer, such as metastasis-free, cancer-specific, or overall survival, is highly controversial. Despite multiple meta-analyses, there have been a lack of robust high-level evidence in support of this. The final two papers I'd like to highlight to you address this very topic. The team led by Dr. Listingi from the University of São Paulo in Brazil have performed the first prospective randomized trial of pelvic lymph node dissection in prostate cancer. Their paper, a prospective single center phase three trial in patients with intermediate and high risk clinically localized prostate cancer was published in European Urology in May 2021 and presented at EMUC in Athens later in the year. They recruited 300 patients who were randomized to a limited lymphadenectomy, including obturator nodes only, or an extended lymphadenectomy, including obturator, external iliac, internal iliac, common iliac, and presacral nodes bilaterally. The primary goal of the trial was to demonstrate at least a 15% advantage in five-year biochemical recurrence-free survival in the extended group. The median number of lymph nodes harvested and the percentage of patients with positive lymph nodes was significantly higher in the extended group. After a median follow-up of 53.4 months, the primary endpoint of the trial was not met. However, in a subgroup analysis of patients with ISAP grade 3 to 5 disease, there was a trend towards improved biochemical recurrence-free survival in the extended group. The secondary endpoints of metastasis-free and cancer-specific survival were also not met. The study did reiterate that extended lymphadenectomy significantly improves lymph node staging. Another important paper published in European Urology Oncology in August 2021 was led by Dr. Karim Tuigier and his team from Memorial Sloan Kettering, who compared limited and extended pelvic lymph node dissection in a single centre clinically integrated randomised trial. They recruited a large cohort of over 1,400 patients randomised to either limited or extended pelvic lymph node dissection. Cluster randomization occurred in this trial as each surgeon was randomized to one lymph node technique for a three month period. It was a superiority trial, with the primary endpoint being time to biochemical recurrence or initiation of treatment with hormones, radiation, or chemotherapy for prostate cancer. After a median follow up of 3.1 years, the authors found no significant difference in biochemical recurrence free survival between the two groups. There was a small difference in the median number of lymph nodes removed and the rate of positive nodes detected between the two groups. Congratulations to Dr. Tougier and his colleagues who were recently awarded best paper of 2021 by European Neurology Oncology. So where does this leave pelvic lymph node dissection in prostate cancer in 2022? 
Well, this trial shows us that extended dissection doesn't offer any advantage over limited dissection. But the real question is, is there a value in node dissection at all? What should future trials look like? We recently spoke with Dr. Tuger on GUCAST for his thoughts. Um, I, I am pleased to tell you that the lesson learned from, from this trial is the trial that we started about a year and a half ago of pelvic lymph node dissection versus no pelvic lymph node dissection. Yeah. Same design, same uh, size trial, same low cost trial, and it's accruing. We are down about 500 patients already, and uh, the accrual is going quite fast. No. Of course, the other consideration in the management of localized prostate cancer today is the impact of PSMA imaging in staging and the possibility of PSMA radio-guided surgery for this population. Very important question, so watch this space. Now, back to our patient. He underwent a robotic prostatectomy here at Peter Mac, with final pathology showing a T2 Gleason Grey Group 3 prostate cancer with clear margins. He continues to do very well indeed. So there you have it, four great trials that have advanced our knowledge and given us insights into the complexities of diagnosing and treating prostate cancer. Congratulations to all the authors and patients involved. We look forward to more fantastic surgical trials to highlight next year.